Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm instructor Jim Pytel. Today's topic of discussion is the combined gas law. Our objective is to examine the relationship of pressure, volume, and temperature for ideal gases. Even the dumbest D student in the most broken school system in the most backward state, Mississippi, I'm looking at you, should be able to differentiate between the three principal forms of matter, solids, liquids, and gases. Solids are characterized by having a definite shape and a definite volume. The molecules composing a solid are in close contact with one another and don't move around that much. Liquids are characterized by having a definite volume but no definite shape and conform to the dimensions of their container. The molecules composing a liquid are in close contact with one another, however, they're free to slide around. Lastly, gases have no definite volume nor defined shape and fill the shape and volume of their container. The molecules composing a gas aren't in close contact with one another and they buzz around like a swarm of bees. The hotter the gas, the angrier the bees. All that empty space inside a gas gives gases a unique property, that of compressibility. Solids and liquids, in ordinary circumstances, aren't all that compressible. However, gases, because of their compressibility, exhibit different pressures, volumes, and temperatures at different states of compression. These properties are predictable and relatively straightforward using a simple thought experiment. In keeping with our earlier bee analogy, Go outside, trap a bunch of bees and put them in a balloon and then squeeze the balloon. The balloon gets smaller. As a result, the compressed bees experience more frequent collisions with one another than the balloon walls. As the balloon gets smaller and smaller, the bees get angrier and angrier because their collisions are more frequent and forceful. In short, as volume goes down, both pressure and temperature inside the balloon go up. I say again, as volume goes down, both pressure and temperature go up. The simple thought experiments demonstrates a change in one property, i.e. decrease in volume, results in a predictable change in the other two, i.e. temperature and pressure go up. While it's possible to discuss all three properties simultaneously, it's perhaps easier to deal with only two variables at a time and keeping the third constant. In fact, that's how the Gilded Age scientists Charles Boyle and Guy Lussac developed their independent theories about ideal gases. Standing upon the shoulders of these intellectual giants, Later, lazier scientists combine their three independent findings into one unified combined gas law. Pressure 1 times volume 1 divided by temperature 1 equals pressure 2 times volume 2 divided by temperature 2, where the subscript 1 represents some initial condition and the subscript 2 means some new change condition. Since gases are compressible, we first need to establish some standard frame of reference to act as a basis of comparison. Depending upon your country of origin, one might measure gas quantities in units of standard cubic feet or standard cubic meters. Flow rate measurements in pneumatic systems are often specified in units of standard cubic feet per minute, abbreviated as SCFM. Here's a quick demonstration of flow rate measurements. Consider a pneumatic flow meter, schematically represented as kind of a baseball looking circle. Using a short length of 4 millimeter diameter pneumatic hose, when I crack open the on-off valve, the thimble in the flow meter floats to about 4.2 ish standard cubic feet per minute. If, however, I use the same length of a much smaller 2 mm diameter hose, when I crack open the on-off valve, the flow meter indicates flow drops to a paltry 0.6-ish standard cubic feet per minute. One would expect to observe similar effects if you use a longer length of similar diameter hose. To make matters much worse, consider the compounded effects of smaller diameter and longer length hose, such that flow rate is effectively choked off but to the tiniest puff of air. Long story short, keep hose lengths as short as possible and use reasonably sized large diameter hoses to avoid restrictions in flow rate. Additionally, avoid sharp bends when routing hoses as these two exhibit detrimental effects to flow. A standard cubic foot of air occupies one cubic foot of volume, being a cube 12 inches high, 12 inches wide, and 12 inches deep, or 1,728 cubic inches. Given gases are compressible, other important properties define the standard cubic foot, specifically a temperature of 68 degrees Fahrenheit, a relative humidity of 36%, and an atmospheric condition at sea level, i.e. 0 PSI gauge or 14.7 PSI absolute. Given these standard conditions, there exists a constant, finite amount of gas molecules inside the space. Now here's the important part. One can take this same quantity of gas and compress it or expand it to any size, but it still remains a standard cubic foot of air. If you want to think of it this way, a standard cubic foot is not a measurement of volume, since the volume of a compressible substance is changeable, but rather it is a means of measuring the quantity of gas molecules at specified conditions. Consider a standard cubic foot of air in three different locations. 
One, on a 68 degree Fahrenheit beach at sea level. Two, on top of a 68 degree Fahrenheit mountain. And three, at the bottom of a 68 degree Fahrenheit ocean. In all three scenarios, temperature is constant. However, pressure changes. Less pressure on the mountain. More pressure at the bottom of the ocean. Ask yourself, how would a standard cubic foot of air respond to these three different scenarios? Would the volume expand or contract? At sea level, the standard cubic foot of air remains a cubic foot in volume because that's the conditions that define the standard cubic foot, i.e. 68 degrees Fahrenheit, at sea level with a specified humidity. On top of the mountain, there exists less atmosphere, thus less pressure, and the same quantity of gas is free to expand, i.e. decrease the pressure and volume goes up. At the bottom of the ocean, with tons of water overhead, pressure substantially increases and the same quantity of gas is crushed into a smaller volume, i.e. increase the pressure and volume goes down. The thought experiment suggests that given constant temperature, volume is inversely proportionate to absolute pressure. Decrease the pressure and volume goes up. Increase the pressure and volume goes down. With temperature being held constant, this is often expressed mathematically as P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2, where again one is the initial conditions and two represents some new change state. We'll examine numerical calculations the importance of the qualifier absolute in a moment, but for now, just consider the fundamental behavior of the statement. Consider the beach as scenario one. There exists a certain pressure one and a certain volume one. We decrease the pressure on the top of the mountain in scenario two. P2 goes down. Given P1 times V1 must equal P2 times V2, if P2 goes down, V2 must go up. It makes sense. Again, consider the beach as scenario one. We increase the pressure at the bottom of the ocean. P2 goes up. Given P1 times V1 must equal P2 times V2, if P2 goes up, V2 must go down. Again, it makes sense. Before we move on, I need to make something absolutely clear. All three scenarios, despite their different volumes, represent one standard cubic foot of air. A standard cubic foot is again, not a means of measuring volume, but rather measuring a quantity of gas molecules. Related to this observation, Consider actuator speed at different load-induced pressure conditions. For hydraulic applications, flow rate of an incompressible liquid like oil is theoretically unaffected at different pressure conditions, not so for pneumatic systems using compressible gases. As you are no doubt aware, flow rate controls actuator speed. This statement remains true for pneumatic actuators as it does for hydraulic actuators. The problem is, the volume of a compressible gas isn't constant for different pressure conditions as it is for hydraulic systems. One standard cubic foot of air occupies less physical space at higher pressure conditions and more physical space at lower pressure conditions. This is to suggest pneumatic actuators might move slower at higher load induced pressures despite flow rate being constant. I say again, even if flow rate, i.e. the standard cubic feet per minute or SCFM remains constant, higher pressure conditions might mean that that same quantity of gas occupies less physical space and actuators may slow down. Conversely, at lower load induced pressures, actuators might move faster because the same quantity of gas occupies more physical space. Moving on, let's try a different thought experiment. One that occurs at the same altitude, i.e. the same pressure conditions. Given constant pressure, how does temperature and volume of gas relate? Let's say you've got three identical balloons, each containing one standard cubic foot of air. One balloon you keep in your 68 degree Fahrenheit house, another one you kick outside on a cold Montana winter day, and the third you tie up next to a fireplace. How will each balloon respond to the different temperature conditions? Most likely the cold balloon outside the house will shrivel up, shrink and blow away, whereas the balloon next to the fireplace will swell in size. This is to suggest given constant pressure conditions, volume is proportional to absolute temperature. In short, decrease the temperature, volume goes down increase the temperature, volume goes up. This is often expressed mathematically as V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2, where V1 and T1 are the initial conditions and V2 and T2 represent some new change state. Again, we'll examine numerical calculations and the importance of the qualifier absolute in a moment, but for now, just consider the fundamental behavior of this statement. Consider the house as state one. There exists a certain volume one and a certain temperature one. We kick the balloon outside and decrease the temperature. T2 goes down. Given V1 over T1 must equal V2 over T2, if T2 goes down, V2 must also go down. It makes sense. 
Again, consider the house as state one. We tie the balloon next to the fireplace and increase the temperature. T2 goes up. Given V1 over T1 must equal V2 over T2, if T2 goes up, V2 must also go up. Again, it makes sense. Let's try one last thought experiment, one that occurs using a rigid metal container, i.e. volume is now being held constant. Given constant volume, how would pressure inside the container respond to different temperatures? Consider three rattle cans of spray paint with the top sealed tight. One you keep in your 68 degree Fahrenheit house, another one you leave outside on a Minnesota sidewalk midwinter, and the third you toss in a bonfire. How will each can of paint respond to the different temperature conditions? Most likely, the pressure inside the cold can left outside will decrease, whereas the pressure inside the hot can on the campfire will reach dangerously high levels. This is to suggest, given constant volume conditions, absolute pressure is proportional to absolute temperature. In short, decreased temperature, pressure goes down, increased temperature, pressure goes up. This is often expressed mathematically as P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2, where P1 and T1 are the initial conditions, and P2 and T2 represent some new state. Again, we'll examine numerical calculations and the importance of the qualifier absolute in a moment, but for now, just consider the fundamental behavior of the statement. Consider the can in the house as state one. There exists a certain pressure one and a certain temperature one. We left an identical can outside and decreased the temperature. T2 goes down. Given P1 over T1 must equal P2 over T2, if T2 goes down, P2 must also go down. That makes sense. Again, consider the can in the house as state one. If we toss the identical can into a campfire and increase the temperature, T2 goes up. Given P1 over T1 must equal P2 over T2, if T2 goes up, P2 must also go up. Let's tie these three thought experiments together. We have now three relationships of pressure, volume, and temperature that can be summarized, or if you will, combined into one combined gas law, such that P1 times V1 over T1 equals P2 times V2 over T2. As I mentioned earlier, most analysis scenarios involve keeping one property constant, changing one property, and then seeing how the third responds. For example, if T1 equals T2, temperature can be removed from consideration so the combined gas law simplifies to P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2 for constant temperature scenarios consistent with our earlier observations. Similarly, if P1 equals P2, pressure can be removed from consideration so the combined gas law simplifies to V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2 for constant pressure scenarios consistent with our earlier observations. Lastly, if V1 equals V2, volume can be removed from consideration so the combined gas law simplifies to P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2 for constant volume scenarios consistent with our earlier observations.